Good afternoon, viewers, grade 11 learners, and educators. I am Noe Munso. I'm here to revise all the topics which are expected to be covered in the first term in preparation for the test that we are going to write before the end of the term. So please take note that the essay has been removed. So the format of the question paper for a test is as follows. It consists of section A. So in section A, you get the short answer questions such as multiple choice, terminology, matching columns. And then in section B, you get a variety of questions. Without any waste of time, let us get started. I'll start first by revising the microorganisms. The first microorganisms that we're going to talk about okay, is viruses. So there are different types of viruses, as you can see. Some of them are helical in shape, some are spherical, and some are, are complex, some are polyhedral. So viruses are very small. They cannot be seen with our naked eyes. They have properties of living things and properties of the non-living things. So a property of a living thing that a virus has is that it is able to reproduce only when it is inside a cell of a host. Properties of the non-living things is that viruses cannot respire to release energy. Viruses cannot grow. Viruses are acellular. They don't have any structures of a cell like the cytoplasm, like the cell membrane, you name them. So what you can see here is that a virus is made up of a protein coat. So now the protein coat is called a capsid. So here it's a protein coat. It is called a capsid. So inside a protein coat, we get a nucleic acid. So now the nucleic acid it's either RNA or DNA. In one virus, you can't get both DNA and RNA. So a virus that uh, attacks an animal either has DNA or RNA. But a virus that attacks a plant only has RNA. So as you can see, here we're having a virus which is causing influenza. So the coronavirus is of this uh, shape. So some viruses, as you can see, they have a tag. Coming to the bacteria. Okay, this is the structure of a bacterium cell. Bacteria are small. They cannot be seen with our naked eyes. 
So, a bacterium cell has a layer outside. The layer outside here prevents the virus from drying out. The layer is called a capsule. Apart from uh, this capsule, a virus has a cell wall. So the cell wall is found below the capsule. So the function of the cell wall is to protect the inner contents of a cell. Below the cell wall, there is a cell membrane. So the cell membrane of a bacterium cell is called the plasma, the plasma membrane. It encloses the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm, it's liquid-like or jelly-like. It contains the ribosomes and this long-coiled uh, DNA, which is from a single-stranded chromosome, and another DNA here, which is called a plasmid. So the plasmid, it's round in shape. So this plasmid plays a role in the production of medicine as well as in the production of the genetically modified crops. You learn more about it in grade A12. A bacterium cell has a tail which is called a flagellum. It is used uh, for movement. Bacteria are prokaryotic. Why are we saying that they are prokaryotic? They don't have a nucleus. You only see this uh, DNA. So this doesn't make the nucleus. So hence we say they are prokaryotic. So now the area where this DNA is found is called the nucleoid. Viruses like bacteria, they cause disease. They are found uh, in different uh, shapes. Before going to that, there are hair-like structures. I've left them out. They are called the pili or pillars. They are used for attachment. So virus, uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, bacteria are found in different uh, shapes. We have the, the round ones, which are called uh, the cocky, the rod-shaped ones, which are called uh, the bacilli or the bacillus. And then we have the comma-shaped, which are called the vibro. We have uh, the spiral ones, which are called the spirilla. Coming to the protists, there are different types of protists. Some are fungi-like, an example, it's a slime mold. Some are animal-like, just like a amoeba. So the protrusions that you see here are the false feet. They are, use, they are used uh, for movement. And then here we have Euclina. It has characteristics of a plant and an animal. The characteristic of an animal that it has, it is this tail, it is used for movement. And then this green part, which contains a chlorophyll, it's a characteristic of a plant. The same happens to the dinoflagellate. Here we have a paramecium. 
it looks like an animal. It has hair like structures for moving as well as for attachment. And then we have a diatom. So this diatom, it's plant like. And then there are those that are animal like. And then last but not least, we have an example here of a protist, which looks like a plant. So coming to their mode of nutrition, some are heterotrophic. We have those that are autotrophic. Many of them are unicellular, but we have those that are multicellular. So they have a true nucleus, mean that they are the eukaryotes. Coming to the fungi, we have different types. So here we have an yeast, as example of a fungus, it causes a disease which is called a thrush that you see here on the tongue. Another example of a fungus, it's a rhizopus that we see on bread or on jam. And then we have the club of fungi, an example here is the mushroom and many others. So characteristics of the fungi, they are multicellular, they have a true nucleus. They have a cell wall. The cell wall is made up of chitin. So here we have an example of a rhizopus. So it has the threads like structures, which are called the mycelium. One filament is called hyphae. So we have hyphae that uh, grow upwards. They are called the sporangiophore. They bear the spores. Spores are covered by a covering which is called the sporangium. We have those that grow horizontally, maybe along the surface of the bread. They are the stolons. And then we have those that grow downwards they penetrate uh, the bread, they are called the rhizoids. So now this I've covered. Coming to immunity. What is immunity? Immunity simply means the ability of the body to resist uh, infections. We have two types of immunity. We have innate immunity. And then secondly, we have adaptive immunity. I'll start first with innate immunity. When do we say immunity, it's innate. Innate immunity, it's inborn immunities. These are immunities that we are born with, such as the skin which is not broken, the mucous uh, membranes, 
inflammation and fever, the phycocyte cells, the lymphocyte cells, and the TIS. They protect us against any form of infection. So coming to adaptive uh, immunity, sometimes uh, this uh, adaptive immunity is called acquired immunity. So it is divided into natural and artificial. So I'll start first with natural immunity. It is divided into passive and active. In passive uh, Adapt, uh, in, uh, in passive uh, adaptive uh, immunity or passive acquired immunity, antibodies are transferred from the mother to the baby to the placenta. And then when it, it comes to, to active, here, you, you get uh, the antibodies or your body is able to produce antibodies as a result of infection. Hence, it is called active. So now you need to know that where there is active, your body is stimulated to produce uh, antibodies. And then where the immunity is passive, your body doesn't produce uh, antibodies. These antibodies uh, are taken uh, from some way, from one organism, and then they get uh, introduced uh, into your body. So I forgot to explain what do we mean when we say the immunity is adaptive or acquired. So now this immunity you are not born with, but you obtain it through your lifetime. You, you get it as a result of you being exposed to certain pathogens. Mean that before you could have them, you must be exposed to viruses. So you are not born with this type of immunity. So now let me quickly come to the second type of acquired or adaptive immunity. It is called a uh, artificial. So now there are two types, passive and active. Remember I said in passive, your body is not stimulated to produce antibodies. So here antibodies, may be transferred from where, from an animal into your body or from one organism to the other. An example is if you suffer from, uh, from tetanus, antibodies, they may be transferred from where, from a horse into your body. Coming to uh, active immunity through immunization. So you acquire immunity as a result of you being uh, vaccinated. So in, remember I said in active immunity, your body is stimulated to produce uh, antibodies. So during immunization, you are given a dead virus or a weak virus. So now once it gets into your body, then your body uh, is activated to produce antibodies. Let us take a short break. Welcome back from a uh, break. So the second topic is biodiversity and reproduction in plants. 
So now the first group of plants that we're going to talk about is the bryophytes. Let us quickly talk about uh, their characteristics. They are found in a water environment, no vascular and strengthening uh, tissues. The main uh, generation here is the gametophyte. The generation which is not dominant, it is called uh, the sporophyte. This generation produces uh, the spores for asexual uh, reproduction. So for sexual uh, reproduction to take place, water is needed to move from this to this point. So here we have uh, the male organs and the female uh, organs. So bryophytes, they don't have true roots, true stem, and true leaves. So now they are called thallus plants. Come into the pteridophytes. Okay, they grow in moist and shady environments. The dominant generation here is called uh, the sporophyte. It is made up of roots. These roots are true. Stem, true. Leaves are true. So now the leaves. They bear the spores on their underside. So now the leaves with spores on the underside are called the sporophylls. So in order for fertilization to take place here, water is needed. Here we have the male organs. And then here we have the female organs. So water is needed for sperms to move from here to here. Coming to the gymnosperms. So what is it that we need to know about uh, the gymnosperms? So we need to know that the dominant generation is the sporophyte. It is made up of true roots, stems, and leaves. So as you can see here, the leaves are needle-shaped. They are thin. They have cuticle to cut on the water loss. Here you see the cones. We have male cones, which are found a in clusters, they are small in size. They produce a pollen inside here. When you shake it, you will uh, find that uh, the male cone will be covered by means of a yellowish uh, powder, which is called a uh, pollen. So now, a male cone is sometimes referred to as a pollen uh, cone, as a result of this uh, pollen which it, uh, which it uh, produces. Coming to the female uh, cone, so this female cone produces the seeds. As you can see, the seeds are, are naked. They are not a uh, covered by means of a sac. Remember here, we get an oval with an egg in a scaly leaf. Here we inside we get what now pollen. So now the pollen is the male gametophyte. The oval is the female gametophyte. So they are both hidden. So in order for a pollen to move from here to here, Water is not uh, needed, but what is needed will be wind and other agents.
come into the angel spam. It is terrestrial. Just like gymnospam, it has uh, true roots, stem, and leaves. It has conducting tissues, xylem here, phloem, I I'm sorry, xylem here, xylem again here, and xylem here in the leaves. Phloem here, phloem, phloem. So the other thing that you need to know about a uh, angiosperms is that the seeds or seeds are enclosed in fruits and for fertilization to take place here again water is not needed but they are agents of pollination to take pollen from the male part to the female uh, part. A reproduction in plants. We know that we have two types, sexual and asexual. In sexual reproduction, Two partners are needed, but when it comes to asexual reproduction, partners are not needed. So in asexual reproduction, offsprings, they are genetically identical, but in sexual reproduction, offspring, they don't look exactly the same as they have the genetic material from an egg and a sperm or from both parents. Coming to a flower as a reproductive structure, we know the parts, stamen, male part that has an anther and a filament, female part, ovary, style and the stigma, the colored part the corolla. Separate part is called the petal. Here, the green structures, they are called the calyx. One is called a sepal. This part are those uh, leaves like structures that you see uh, in an apple, at the bottom part of an apple. So pollination, it is a transfer of pollen from an anther to a stigma. So I said, in order for pollen to be transferred, agents are needed. So as we can see here, the agent here is a bee. So apart from a bee, the agents of pollination are bits and wind. So there are two types of pollination, self and cross-pollination. In self, pollen transfer from an anther to a stigma. In cross, pollination is transferred from an anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower. Let us talk about the agents. We have flowers which are pollinated by wind. So let us look at their characteristics. The stigma should be a feathery to catch wind. The filament must be thin and long to expose the anther. Inside here, there must be a lot uh, of pollen. No corolla here. As you can see, no scent. Insect uh, pollinated a uh, flower. As you can see, the corolla, brightly colored, a sweet nectar to attract uh, insects. 
The stigma is sticky. Beds pollinated. Flowers have no scent, no landing platform for beds. Flowers are red, pink. Flowers are a red, pink, and orange. Let us take a short break. Welcome back. Let us move to the last topic, animal kingdom. Let us start first with uh, the general characteristics which are shared by all the animals. They are multicellular, eukaryotes. They don't have chlorophyll. They are heterotrophs. They don't have a cell wall. Okay. Coming to the main groups of animals, we have the invertebrates and the vertebrates. Invertebrates are animals without a vertebral column, and then the vertebrates are animals with a vertebral column. So apart from these general characteristics that animals do share uh, in common, animals don't look the same. Hence, they have been classified into different groups called the phyla. We have animals which belong to the phylum porifera, nidaria, platyhelminthes, anelida, arthropoda, and codata. The first five are the invertebrates. And then the last group, we get the vertebrates. So scientists have classified the organisms which belong to these uh, six groups in terms of their body plan. What do we mean by the body plan? We mean the structure and shape of the organism's body. Let us uh, quickly have a look at the key features of a body plan. Number one, it's symmetry and cephalization. Number of tissue layers in the embryo, a coelom in the blood system. Number of, 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 of uh, openings in the gut. So let's take them one by one. Symmetry and cephalization. We say an animal has symmetry when it has a regular shape or when it has sides which are similar or when the opposite sides are similar. So an animal that doesn't have a regular shape we say it is asymmetrical. Here, sides are not similar. Opposite sides, again, are not uh, similar. So there are two types of uh, symmetry. We have the first type, which is called a uh, bilateral. In bilateral, when you cut uh, this animal longitudinally in one plane, you'll find that the left side is similar to the right side. The same here, when you cut this uh, spade longitudinally, this side is similar to this side. Coming to the second type of symmetry, Apart from bilateral symmetry, we have a radial uh, symmetry. When do we say that an animal has, a, it's radially symmetrical or it has a radial symmetry? Okay, when uh, the body parts are arranged in a circle, just like here, or when an organ, I'm sorry, or when a, an organism 
is just a round. Remember, radius is a half of a what? Of a second. So in radial symmetry, you can cut an animal in any plane through the center, you get a identical halves. Here, you cut it in any plane, you still get identical halves. Cephalization is the accumulation of the brain and sense organs at the anterior end of an organism. So now the second aspect of a body plan is number of tissue layers uh, in the embryo. Some animals, they have uh, two layers. So if an animal has two layers, it is it's referred to as diplo, uh, diploblastic. So the layers are the ectoderm. Sorry, the layers are the ectoderm on the uh, outside. So now this ectoderm gives rise to the epidermis and the skin. Secondly, we have the inside a layer, which is called the endoderm. So the endoderm gives rise to the gut or the alimentary canal. So here this animal, it has a non layer, which is called the, the mesotlia. We found this in the Nidarians, Nidarians. Other animals are having three layers. They are triploblastic. So layers that makes a triploblastic animal are number one, the blue layer, the ectoderm, uh, the middle layer, which is called the mesoderm, it's a new layer. So the mesoderm gives rise to the skeletal muscles, the muscles of your body, blood vessels, connective tissue, and the others. And then last but not least, we have the inner layer, which is the endoderm. So another aspect of a body plan, it's a silom. A silom is a body cavity with a fluid within the mesoderm or between the digestive tract and the ectoderm. Examples of siloms in the human body is the peritoneal cavity, where it surrounds the digestive organs, pleural cavity, where it surrounds the lungs, pericardial cavity, where it surrounds the heart. Please take note that a gut is not a body cavity, as it is not derived from the mesoderm. So here I have a few functions of the silom. They create a space for, organ for organs to grow, they prevent, uh, a silom prevents friction. It makes it possible for the gut wall and the body wall to function independently. In some other animals, it acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. So there are two types of siloms, a true silom and a false uh, silom. So animals that have a true silom, they are called silo silomates. Examples of animals with a true silom are the annelids, the arthropods, and the chordates. Pseudocilum, a false silom. There's a cavity which is found between the mesoderm and the endoderm. So animals such as the nematodes, they have a pseudocilum 
and then they are said to be coelomates. Animals that do not have either a true coelom or a pseudocoelom, they are called as coelomates. Examples are the porifera and the cnidarians. Let me show you. Animals with coeloms and without, and those with a false coelom. Here I have a flatworm. As you can see, remember I said a coelom. It's a cavity which splits the mesoderm. So here, the blue layer is the ectoderm, and then the red one, the mesoderm, and the, the blue one, the endoderm, and then the gut. There is no a cavity here. So a, a flatworm, as a result of that, it is said to be a coelomate. Here I have an annulate. An example here, it's an, uh, it's an F worm. Let us look as to whether it has a coelom or not. So we have the outside layer. I said it is called the ectoderm. And then the red layer, it is called uh, the mesoderm. Can you see that there is a, a cavity here, this white part? represents a cavity. It splits what now? The mesoderm into what now? Into two. So if an animal has this cavity, then we say that it is coelomate. And then coelocoelomate, an example here, it's a nematoda. So let us look at the layers and see if we get a coelom here is the outside layer, the ectoderm, and then the, the red layer, the, the mesoderm. And then we get a cavity here between the mesoderm and the endoderm. So now this cavity is regarded as a false uh, coelom because it doesn't split what the middle of them. So animals that have a cavity between the middle of them and the end of them, they are called pseudocylomates. Blood systems, there are two types of blood systems. It's either an animal has an open blood system or a closed uh, blood system. In an open blood system, the blood doesn't uh, always stay inside uh, the blood vessels. It will escape the blood vessel, the blood vessels, and move into a space which is called the hemocyl here. So an example, it's a locus. It has a heart, blood vessels, and then the, 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 the blood will get into this space. Closed blood system, here I have an example of an elija, an F1. So as we can see, we have the heart and the blood vessels. So here the blood never leaves uh, the blood vessels. Coming to the number of openings in the gut, there are animals with two openings and animals with one uh, opening. As you can see here, we are having the cnidarians. An example is hydra. It has one opening. So it is said to have a blind gut. And then here we are having an annelid. It has a mouth and an anus. Can you see that the openings are two? So it is said to, to have a, a true gut. Disadvantages of a blind gut. There's a mixing of digested and undigested food. Digested and undigested, and undigested food, they move in two directions. So in a true gut, food will travel in one direction only. 
So now the food will enter the animal's body through the mouth and undigested food will leave through the anus. Advantages of a true gut. Since the food moves in only one direction, specialization of the gut occurs, means that different regions become adapted to perform different functions. Coming to uh, the animals that belong to the phylum uh, porifera. So here we have the sponge. What is it that we need to know about them? They are asymmetrical, no shape. Walls are porous to allow water to get into a cavity here, which is called a, the spongocil. The water carries small animals, which are the food for this animal. So digestion will occur inside uh, the loose cells, and then it is called intracellular. So water will move inside the cavity, and it will be expelled through the top opening, which is called the osculum. So now this is not a, an anus or a mouth, guys. So, the porifera, they don't have muscle cells. They don't have tissue layers. As the cells uh, are loose, they are not separated by, by membranes. Coming to the second phylum, here we get the cnidarians. So what is it that we need to know about uh, the cnidarians? Is that they are found uh, in two forms. The first form is the, the polyp, where an organism uh, has a shape of a vase. And then the second shape is called a, the medusa. So in the medusa, an organism looks like an, an, an umbrella. So now the tentacles are facing downwards. Here they are facing upwards. They surround what now a mouth as what as an opening, a mouth as an opening. I mean that this animal here, it has a blind uh, gut. So animals are bilateral, uh, I, I'm sorry, when it, come, w w when it comes to symmetry, animals are radially symmetrical. Why are we saying that? There are body parts which are found in a circle and then they are surrounding uh, the mouth. When it comes to the tissue layer, it is a diploblastic. It has the ectoderm, and then it has the endoderm. So this is a cavity, which is called a, the cilenteron. So it has sensitive nerve cells. So I forgot, I forgot to mention that the polyp, the polyp is sedentary, and then the medusa, it's free floating. That helps it to eat or to sense danger. It has the, te the, the tentacles to catch food. No blood, uh, bl blood vessels. No silom. So this cannot be called a silom because it is not found uh, in the mesoderm. Coming to the platy helminthes. The word platy means flat. Helminthes means a worm.
So now here we have a flat web. What are the characteristics? When you look at this animal, uh, it is bilaterally symmetrical. When you cut it here, you get two uh, identical uh, halves. And then it has cephalization. The small brain here with uh, the sense organs. It is those eventually uh, differentiated. It has the upper part and the lower part. So the animal is a silomate. So the animal has one uh, opening here, which is the mouth, meaning that it has a blind gut. But tapeworm doesn't have a blind gut. We have covered the characteristics. Coming to the phylum Anelida. So a well-known example here, uh, it's an earthworm. What is it that we need to know about uh, the earthworm? Is that, okay, it is bilaterally uh, symmetrical. You get it? You, you cut it into, you cut it in one plane, you get two identical halves. And then it has, it shows a cephalization. It has the brain in sense organs. They are located at the anterior part. And then it has a coelom. It has a true gut, the mouth, and the anus. The blood system here is closed. Coming to the arthropoda. So now these are the examples of the arthropods. Characteristics. The body is divided into head, thorax, and abdomen. Most of them, they have six they have three pairs of jointed uh, legs. They are bilaterally symmetrical. You cut it here, you get two identical uh, halves. They are triploblastic. The animal shows a cephalization. It has an exoskeleton, which is made up of chitin. So the skeleton has advantages and disadvantages. It protects uh, the inner parts. Uh, it prevents uh, desiccation. The disadvantages or a disadvantage is that it limits a uh, growth of an organism and then it makes an organism to move very slowly. The last phyla, Codata, these are the vertebrates. Bilaterally symmetrical, halves left and right side are identical. Cephalization, brain with the sense organs, they are silomate. The blood system is closed. They have a true gut. We have a mouth. And then we have an anus here at the back. So we have come to the end of our presentation. This is just a, a table. It's so important. Make it a point that you know it. I have covered uh, it in the presentation. So if we are asked to mention the characteristics of the Nidarians, you mainly make mention of these uh, features here, which are in our table. Okay? Before we conclude, let me talk about the roles of the invertebrates in agriculture and in the ecosystem. Insects are source of food. They are eaten, e.g. shrimps and what, and the locusts. Honey comes from bees. 
bees, flowers, uh, I'm sorry, bees, flies and moths, they pollinate flowers. Some insects are parasitic, e.g. a tick on a cow. Houseflies, they spread disease, they regulate the population size. Cockroach, cockroaches, they carry poliovirus, regulate the population size. Some insects are poisonous, regulate the population size. Earthworms, they burrow through the soil and then they cause the soil to be aerated. aerated. Oxygen will get in and then carbon dioxide will move uh, out. And then they also play a role as uh, decomposers. They feed on what now? On dead leaves. Whatever is locked in, a dead, leaf, in, in dead leaves get uh, released and it is uh, recycled. The earthworms uh, feces, which are called the casts, they enrich uh, the soil. So let us take a, a short break. And then from there, we'll be taking the questions. Thank you. OK, welcome back to our last uh, session. So here we're just going to take uh, the questions. The first question says, what is the type of immunity that develops as a result of vaccine? Remember, in vac when you are vaccinated, your body is stimulated, uh, meaning that it is activated to produce a immunity. And you get uh, vaccinated as a result of you being exposed to the virus. So your body must produce uh, antibodies. So you're not, you were not born with this type of what's now of immunity, meaning that it is acquired. So what is the correct answer here? A, acquired and active. B, acquired and passive. Passive antibodies are from, uh, from somewhere and then they get uh, introduced into your body. Natural and passive, natural and active. So the correct answer, it's A, acquired and active. E. coli, uh, 1.1.2, E. coli in the human intestines is an example of parasitism, where one organism gets a hit. Symbiosis, two organisms are in contact and they are living together there. Commensalism, one benefits, and the other is not a, a harm. Competition, where organisms uh, compete for a limited uh, uh, resource. So now the correct answer here is symbiosis. The E. coli lives inside, it, it, it is the bacteria which live inside your, your intestine. So now they live, they are in contact uh, with the cells of your body there. So they perform what now, the digestion. And then from there, they break uh, the undigested uh, food into the feces. And then uh, how do they benefit? They eat the food uh, from your intestine. So I said the correct answer will be B. 1.1.3, plant divisions which include mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. We covered uh, that. They are the bryophytes. Interaction where both organisms in a relationship benefit. Mutualism. As I have already explained it. And then 1.1.5, the name given to a plant where true roots, stems, and leaves cannot be distinguished, thallus or enanthalus, it is called a thallus plant, meaning that the correct answer is A. 1.2, give the correct biological term, administration of a vaccine by means of injection or orally to bring about immunity. That is called um, inocu inoculation.
or vaccination. 1.2.2 seed bearing plants uh, with flowers. They are flowering plants. The way in which a plant or an animal protects itself from pathogenic viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and fungi, it is called immune response. The type of reproduction that results in genetically identical offspring, asexual reproduction. So here you match the items. So, but you're not supposed to write a, the weddings here. You just write A only, B only, both A and B. Nitrogen uh, fixing organisms, viruses, bacteria. They are the bacteria. Remember, we do get uh, the bacteria which are found in the roots of the, the legumes. They, they have to convert nitrogen into a nitrate. So we know very well that once nitrogen is converted into nitrate, the proteins will be produced. 1.3.2, the body's response to the presence of disease-causing organisms before it has a chance to cause illness. Is it vaccination or immunity? The correct answer is A, vaccination. An interaction in which two organisms of different species live together in direct contact. Is it competition or symbiosis? Symbiosis, the correct answer is B. Question two. Give labels for, for A. Uh, a is called the plasma lemma or the cell membrane. And then D is called the cell wall. And then E is called uh, the capsule or the slime capsule. And then give the letter only of the part that is used for movement. It is this tail. Okay, it's B. Can be used in production of insulin for diabetes. It's C. Remember I said a bacterium cell has a DNA in a form of a circle which is called a plasmid. Uh, except for the production of medicines such as insulin, give two other uses of the bacteria for humans. They break down the undigested uh, food into feces. They make products such as cheese and yogurt. A grade 11 learner wanted to investigate what factors help mold or fungi to grow on bread. Okay. This learner took four slices of white bread and put different substances on each slice of bread. Slice one was left uh, dry. Slice two, 20 ml of tap water. Slice three, 20 ml of lemon juice. Four, 20 ml of sugar, of sugar water. And then each slice of uh, bread was put in a plastic bag and kept in a dark cupboard for a temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius for two weeks. And then she observed the growth of the mold on four slices of bread. So now here are the results. Name the dependent variable for her investigation. What is it? that this learner uh, is observing the percentage of mold present on the bread will be the dependent uh, variable. Give the ratio of the percentage growth of mold on slide 2 compared to slide 4. Slide 4, slide 2. Here we have 4, 4% 4 and then here we have 2%. So percentage will be okay how much 4 divided by 2 will be 2 so now the ratio here is 2 explain why she included tri bread in her investigation to serve as a control so as to compare the results give three factors that must be controlled in this investigation to make this a valid a uh, test 
like so. The bread must be of bread must be of the same size. Apart from the bread being of a the same size, they must be of a one type, and then environmental conditions again must be kept constant. Suggest why mold does not grow well on the bread. Sprinkle with lemon juice. So lemon juice uh, has as uh, has an acid. So it prevents the growth of the mold on bread. Number three, sorry, question three, 3.1. Let us quickly go to questions. Label parts A, B, and C. A, it's an anther. B, it's a stigma. And then C is the style. Define pollination and write down the part where pollination A, will occur, transfer of pollen from an anther to a stigma, it will occur here in the stigma. Name the two biotic agents for pollination, beds, insects, beds and insects, because it says biotic. Wind is abiotic. Give two ways in which angiosperms are better adapted to terrestrial life than the bryophytes. Angiosperms, they have two roots, stems and leaves, conducting tissues, conducting tissues, the xylems and the phloems. And then when we go to the bryophytes, they don't have conducting tissues no strengthening uh, tissues. They don't have true roots, true stems and leaves. Explain why the above drawn flower cannot be successfully pollinated uh, by, by wind. When you look at the stigma here, it is not a, a feathery. The style, uh, is short. Those are the two things that I see. Study the phylogenetic tree below and answer the questions which follow. Okay, this is our phylogenetic tree. We have the oldest common ancestor, which are uh, the protista. So they underwent speciation and formed the diatoms in the algae on this line. So the algae, oh, it, it forms the, the algae, uh, the bryophytes, the pteridophytes, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. So now this part of a phylogenetic tree is called a, a node. So a node represents a common ancestor, a common ancestor. And then here again we have a, a common a ancestor. So let us take the questions. Which group uses uh, cones to produce the gymnosperms? Explain why bry bryophytes cannot grow tall. So if bryophytes can grow tall, they will uh, flop on each other or they will fall. As they don't have conducting tissues and strengthening uh, tissues. Last but not least, we have questions based on the kingdom uh, animalia. The first question says identify the phyla that is asymmetrical. Does, that doesn't have a shape. We have one, the porifera, that has an open uh, blood uh, 
system. Let me check here. We have the atro the the atro powder. Name types of a xylem that will be found in organisms from a phyla one, phylum one. The type of a xylem. There is no xylem. It's a xylemate. Two, five, and six. Two. Uh, Nidarians. They don't have a silo. And then mm, number five, the arthropoda, they do have a silo. And the last one is a decoductor. They have a true silo. So we have come to the end of 